Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise, and thanks for listening. You're joining over 20,000 people who have downloaded this podcast, and I hope that you learn some Texas history and share this show with your friends. Please keep sending me your suggestions for episodes. A special mention in this episode to a good friend of the show, Shannon Wise, up in Central Texas, who has the same last name, but I don't think we're related. She's a devoted fan, though, and she is certainly wise about Texas in her own right. I also want to mention on this episode that the Texas State History Association's virtual race across Texas is going on right now. We're in the middle of it, as a matter of fact. This is a free Texas history game that you can play at www.raceacrosstexas.com, and it's a game where you answer daily questions on Texas history, throughout the month of July, and you're eligible to win some great prizes. So enter the race and see how you do. I can tell you, if you're a regular listener to this podcast, you know many of the answers already. Again, that's www.raceacrosstexas.com. And best of all, it's free. And I'm entered, so race across Texas with me and see how you do. Well, it's summertime in Texas, and in this episode, we're going to head to the islands. I'm going to tell you about a place in Texas with some interesting history and weave in some historical events that occurred there that affected our national politics. We're going to discuss this interesting area of Texas and its role in Texas history by going back to the 1700s to get wise about Texas. If you take a quick look at a map of the Texas coast, you'll notice a series of barrier islands guarding the mainland shore. These islands began life as sandbars thousands of years ago. The islands were inhabited by the Karankawa Indians when explorers started to reach Texas in the middle 16th century. And if you move down to the middle of the Texas coast, you'll see three islands that are very close together. It's Matagorda Island, San Jose Island, and Mustang Island. And we're going to start our episode today with San Jose Island, but you can bet that we'll be talking about the surrounding area. San Jose Island has been called St. Joseph's Island, which of course is the English translation. It's also known as St. Joe's Island, and it was once referenced along with Matagorda Island, its neighbor to the north. Uh, the Both islands together were called Calibra, but San Jose is its most common name. It's 21 miles long, and it's about five miles wide. La Salle came close to the island on his ill-fated attempt to find the mouth of the Mississippi River, In the late 1600s, the French reportedly landed parties on San Jose Island twice in the 18th century, once in 1712 and once in 1718. Spanish explorer Jose de Escandon explored the islands off Texas, including Padre Island, Mustang Island, and San Jose Island in the mid-1700s. Now, Escandon was interesting. He was a prolific explorer but he's really not well known to most Texans. He was born in Spain, came to New Spain, and colonized a colony named Nuevo Santander, named after his hometown. That colony extended from Mexico all the way to the Guadalupe River in Texas. Escondón was its governor, and he founded several towns that still exist, including Mir, Reynosa, and Carmargo in Mexico, he also founded Laredo, and he founded a place called Nuestra Señora de los Dolores Hacienda, which was between San Ignacio, Texas, and Laredo. And that Nuestra Señora de, lo, de los Dolores, excuse me, was thought to be the first ranch in Texas, and it was the main launch point for expeditions from Mexico into Texas. Now, during the era of Spanish explorers, no good island stories are complete without tales of buried treasure, and San Jose Island is no different. It's said that there are two buried treasures on San Jose Island. The first was a shipment of gold and silver ornaments bound for a cathedral in Veracruz that were on a ship that wrecked near San Jose. The second buried treasure is a tale of a payroll shipment for Spanish soldiers that was lost near San Jose Island but and buried on the island, recovered and buried for safekeeping. Now, nothing has been heard of those treasures since, but as you'll find out, the island has been in private hands for a long time, so who knows? It may still be there. Well, Escandon uh, really got around Texas, and we can give him credit for opening up the Rio Grande Valley for settlement, but let's jump ahead 
to the impresario period in Texas, where multiple budding entrepreneurs sought colonization contracts with the Mexican government. Now, you're familiar with Stephen F. Austin, and we've mentioned Green DeWitt, and we've mentioned David Burnett. But there are two folks that haven't made it into Wise About Texas yet, and these are James Power and James Hewitson. Power was born in County Wexford, Ireland, and Hewitson was born in Kilkenny County, Ireland. Both men found their way to the Mexican capital of Saltillo and also Monclova. Now, I say both towns... Because remember, there was a conflict between those two towns as to which one would be the rightful capital of Coahuila, Texas. Power and Hewitson decided to form a partnership and form a colony in Texas, and their plan was to settle their colony with Irish Catholics and Mexican natives. They expanded their grant several times, and they ended up in some conflicts with some of the other impresarios, and they settled those conflicts by taking coastal land between Coleto Creek and the mouth of the Nueces River, which is near present-day Corpus Christi. And this area included Matagorda, Mustang, and San Jose Island. The Texas Revolution intervened. Texas won her independence, and we had a new government and new laws eventually. And the old impresario grants were essentially or practically void. The impresario contracts weren't really land titles anyway, They were rights granted by the Mexican government to organize and oversee some colonization in Texas. Power argued, though, that he was entitled to own the land, uh, including San Jose Island, but was eventually denied those claims in some cases in the 1850s, his courts. Uh, One of those island cases, by the way, I was looking at some of the cases, one of them involved a man named Deles Denier, and he took a couple of lots in Galveston, quote, by force and arms, Now, I'm a part-time resident of Galveston, and it can be a tough place, but I've yet to engage in armed combat with my neighbors. Anyway, uh, the island folks are just different, as we all know. Anyway, Power managed to start running some cattle on Mustang Island and did so under a lease to Henry Kinney. Now, this is interesting because Henry Kinney was the man who founded the town of Corpus Christi, and it's important for a couple of reasons. First, The Mustang Island Ranch began about 1838, which is earlier than most folks in the area talk about those islands being settled. And second, when reference is made to Matagorda Island or Mustang Island or San Jose Islands, especially in the 1800s, when they use one name, it often means uh, part of all the other islands as well. So though we don't know for sure, that late 1830s ranch could have included San Jose Island. Now, Power's competition for ownership of the island was a group of folks from New Orleans who had received land scrip for their role in helping finance the Texas Revolution. And some of those New Orleans financiers wanted the Texas Barrier Islands because obviously, now this is before the railroads, but obviously the Texas economy would depend on the ports and the maritime industry. The New Orleans group hired a guy named William Little to represent them, and Little pressed the ownership claim Of course, Power opposed it and pressed his own, and this battle would go on until those 1850s cases that I mentioned before when the Texas Supreme Court finally handed Power his final defeat. But in those same cases, the Supreme Court also ruled that the script holders couldn't hold the island either. So that was an interesting twist. The Civil War, of course, came along and would change everything. Now, there was a town on the southern end of San Jose Island, established shortly after Texas independence. That was the town of Aransas, and it became a busy port along the Middle Texas coast. Now, I'm not talking about present-day Port Aransas. I'm talking about on San Jose Island, the town of Aransas, which was right across Aransas Pass from present-day Port Aransas. Two entrepreneurs, Peter Johnson and Charlie Johnson. Now, I don't think they were related, but they ran a successful business in the town of Aransas. They ran wagons to the interior of Texas and ships from Aransas to Corpus Christi and did a lot of shipping, etc., through the town of Aransas. Aransas was eventually destroyed by Union troops during the Civil War and was never rebuilt. And there aren't any traces of the town left on San Jose Island that I'm aware of. Another prominent resident of San Jose Island back in the day was a gentleman named Robert Mercer. Now, Mercer was a lawyer from Lancashire, England, or as he would have said it, Lancashire. He came to America in 1830, and he became a farmer in Indiana. 
He later moved to Mobile, Alabama, and in 1855, he moved to St. Joseph's Island, I presume, to the town of Aransas. I presume that because he shortly crossed Aransas Pass and built a cabin on the north end of Mustang Island. Now, I mentioned that the Union troops destroyed much of the area during the Civil War, and that included burning Mercer's cabin on Mustang Island. And Mercer moved his family closer to Corpus to wait out the war. But after the war, he came back to Mustang Island and he built, rebuilt his house. And what he, uh, his sons were pilots. There is a rather famous, or I should say infamous, bar at the entrance to Matagorda Bay, and Mercer's sons, Ned and John, became ship pilots who charged fees to guide the ships through that treacherous pass. And there are lots of shipwrecks in that area. The Mercers were also farmers. They were also ranches. Their ranch was, ranchers, their name was, uh, ranch name was El Mar, appropriately enough. And they were an interesting family. They actually left some logs that they had written over about 10 years, from 1866 to 1877, and the Port Aransas Museum has published those logs, and they're available in a book. Very interesting to read. Mercer's cabin was built on the site of what is now Port Aransas. Now, before we get further into the Civil War, here's a little fun fact for you. As we learned in, in the episode of Wise About Texas dealing with Texas as joining the United States, the resolution to allow Texas into the United States was signed in March 1845. The citizens of Texas eventually voted to approve it, in November of that year, but on July 26th, 1845, U.S. troops arrived in Texas under the command of future President Zachary Taylor, and they raised the United States flag for the first time on Texas soil, and that's where where he arrived was San Jose Island. So the U.S. flag's flag was raised first time on Texas soil on San Jose Island. And of course, Zachary Taylor's army was gearing up for the Mexican War that everybody anticipated and eventually occurred. During the Civil War, however, Texas was a major shipping point for Confederate cotton to Europe to finance the war effort. And Aransas Pass between San Jose and Mustang Island was one of those shipping points. The Federal Navy began blockading Aransas Pass in early 1862 and Union Commander John Kittredge clamped down on Aransas Pass as well as the livestock enterprises that were on San Jose and Mustang Island. One day, Kittredge and some of his sailors were captured by some Confederate cavalry, and his replacement wasn't quite as skilled a commander, and the Confederate forces were able to defeat the blockade and take command of Aransas Pass. Now, on the north part of Mustang Island, just across the pass from San Jose Island, the Confederates built a fort they named Fort Sem, S-E-M-M-E-S. And by the fall of 1863, the Confederates were doing such a good job that Fort Sims became a Union target. The Union mounted an offensive and captured Fort Sims in the winter of 1863. The Union was attacking that Middle Texas coast, by the way, because they had been soundly whipped in the Battle of Sabine Pass, earlier in 1863. After they captured Fort Sims, though, the Union troops marched up San Jose Island toward another Confederate fort that was on Matagorda Island at Cavallo Pass, and this was Fort Esperanza. The Confederates tried to prevent them from making it off San Jose Island, but they were unsuccessful, and after a two-day battle, the Union troops captured Fort Esperanza. The Union had left a garrison on Mustang Island and now occupied the fort on Matagorda. uh, But the Union troops finally left in mid 1864 and the Confederates reoccupied Fort Esperanza. Now, an interesting side note to the Civil War era in this part of Texas was the discovery of a potential Civil War relic in 1980. I say potential because there's some debate about what it was, but the more fun story is that it was a Civil War torpedo raft. You see, during the war, during the Civil War, the Union built these huge rafts designed to be pushed by their ironclad ships into ports, and the torpedoes would be placed on these rafts and pushed into the Confederate ports and detonated. Now, another Union, one Union commander uh, used the rafts to detonate hidden mines at the mouth of Confederate harbors. What he'd do is he'd dangle iron hooks below the raft as it was pushed into the harbor, and they'd set off the mines. The problem with the rafts was they weighed 90 tons, and they required dead calm waters 
to work. So the rafts really weren't all that effective. But in 1980, Hurricane Allen hit the Texas coast and exposed some sort of shipwreck on Mustang Island. Now, some believe that this wreck was one of those Civil War U.S. Navy torpedo rafts, but we don't know for sure. Now, the wreck was covered back up by 1991 and presumably awaits further discovery today. Now, we're going to jump ahead a little bit further in time and take a quick detour to Athens, Texas in the early 1900s. There were two best friends in Athens, Texas, Sid Richardson and Clint Murkison. They grew up together. In the 20s, they both went into the oil business, and they would eventually become very successful, to put it mildly, in the oil business. Murkison bought pieces of Matagorda Island in the 30s and built a big ranch on the lower part of the island, southern part. Richardson followed his best friend's lead, and only he bought all of San Jose Island right next door. Richardson also built a big house uh, to entertain his many friends. One of those friends, by the way, was Elliot Roosevelt. Elliot Roosevelt was the son of FDR, Franklin Roosevelt. He lived in Fort Worth and was involved in the oil business as well as owning a radio station and other interests. And President Franklin Roosevelt would visit Fort Worth many times to see Elliot. Now, I want to go back to the 30s when Roosevelt was attempting to pack the Supreme Court with justices sympathetic to his New Deal legislation. The existing Supreme Court had held some of his New Deal legislation unconstitutional, so he tried to expand the number of justices on the Supreme Court by adding six more. And that was very controversial at the time. But there was a young congressional candidate in Texas who ran his congressional race as a supporter of FDR's court policy. And this young man was from Johnson City, Texas, and his name was Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson had been advised to support FDR's court plan so that FDR's supporters would, of course, support Johnson. Well, soon after the election, Roosevelt decided to take a little fishing trip to the Texas coast, and one of his agenda items was to meet this new congressman, who had run his pro-New Deal, pro-FDR campaign. Well, at this time, FDR had a presidential yacht. The yacht was named the USS Potomac. The Potomac actually began its life as a Coast Guard cutter named the Electra, but FDR took a liking to it, and the Navy claimed the boat and renamed it the USS Potomac, refurbished it to serve as the presidential yacht for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. By the way, after FDR died, that ship was sold, and at one point, Elvis Presley owned FDR's presidential yacht. It was eventually fell into the hands of some drug dealers and was seized again by the federal government, came back into federal government ownership, and they deposited it on the east side of San Francisco Bay where it promptly sank. Uh, They raised it, and a group redid it, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. In any event, the Potomac steamed down to Texas and uh, anchored in the bay, behind San Jose Island. FDR arrived on a Navy destroyer, and a couple of days later, uh, FDR invited Sid Richardson, Jesse Jones from Houston, and Governor Jimmy Allred to visit with him on the Potomac. A couple of days after that, Richardson took the president on a tour of his private San Jose Island, uh, including chasing the herd of buffalo that Richardson had put out there. Now, it wasn't easy getting the president on to San Jose Island, but Texas ingenuity saved the day. Now, as you may know, FDR had suffered from polio. He was in a wheelchair. So Sid Richardson had a great idea. He got a loading chute that he used to load cattle into trucks, and he brought it to the dock so Roosevelt could get in his wheelchair from the boat and roll up onto the land. Well, that was a pretty good idea, if you ask me. Well, Roosevelt saw it and uh, had some reservations about it, which he expressed rather strongly. To Richardson, and Richardson uh, is quoted as saying, oh, Mr. President, you're the biggest bull to ever go down that chute. Well, evidently it worked because FDR got his tour of San Jose Island, and uh, after that they proceeded to Clint Murkison's house on Matagorda Island. Now, I should note that Murkison's oil company had been in some trouble with the government for producing more oil from the East Texas field during that time than they were allotted. That was called hot oil. And after that meeting with Roosevelt, the company ended up paying a small fine entering a no-contest plea, so I guess that lunch tasted pretty good. 
And when the feds eventually seized part of Matagorda Island for a bombing range during World War II, they conveniently left Murchison's part alone, as well as San Jose Island, for that matter. Well, after Roosevelt's visit to San Jose and Matagorda, uh, he went up to Galveston, and he got to meet that young congressman, Lyndon Johnson. And Roosevelt had planned to go from there by train to College Station and to Fort Worth, and he invited LBJ to ride with him. And apparently that meeting went pretty well, too, because LBJ raised a lot of money from Texas for the Democratic Party after meeting with Roosevelt. LBJ would end up helping a lot of his fellow congressmen get elected by raising that Texas money, and those favors would later be repaid as LBJ rose through American politics to be our president. So San Jose Island played a key role in national American politics. Well, let me tell you a little bit of how these islands were set up once they were in the uh, private hands. Murchison had his own power generation capability on Matagorda Island. He built a runway, he built roads, he built fresh water tanks. The house he built could host 30 or so people. And uh, one day Richardson was looking around and he asked Murchison how much it cost to build the house. And and Murchison said $35,000. So Richardson gave his nephew Perry Bass $35,000, told him to build a house on San Jose. Well, he promptly took that money back from Mr. Bass to do an oil deal, telling Mr. Bass that uh, anybody could build a house with $35,000, but it would take a genius to build it with nothing. Anyway, the house got built, and uh, Richardson ended up with a large house. He, too, had a runway with some hangars and other buildings. Oh, by the way, Richardson did not own and never did own a house in Fort Worth. The San Jose Island house was the only house Sid Richardson ever owned. Well, Richardson was at his San Jose retreat uh, when December 7th, 1941, came around. FDR asked him to come to Washington the following week and have lunch to discuss the U.S. oil situation because he knew, of course, that war was coming. On the train to Washington, Richardson ran into a brand-new Army general who was also on his way to Washington, and Richardson invited the general to ride in Richardson's car, and that new general was named Dwight David Eisenhower, who, by the way, was born in Texas. Richardson and Eisenhower would end up being friends for the rest of their lives. Well, Richardson hosted uh, many of the political elite of the country on St. Joseph's Island, or St. Joe's as he called it. In the early 50s, a group met at Richardson Place on San Jose to figure out how to get Eisenhower to run for president. And after that meeting, Richardson would travel to Europe where uh, Eisenhower was commander of NATO, and he took two letters for encouraging Eisenhower to run. One was from Billy Graham. The other was from Clint Murchison. That trip, too, was successful. Well, in 1959, Richardson was again at San Jose with a friend of his who was a doctor, and unfortunately there he suffered a massive heart attack in his room in the house and passed away at his island retreat. Let's move to Matagorda. The Matagorda Island retreat had some interesting events happen through the years. Clint Murchison was business partners with a gentleman named Toddy Lee Wynn, who was also from Dallas. Mr. Wynn was a lawyer. He developed some hotels in the Far East, as well as uh, the famous theme park Six Flags in Arlington. His family had also developed the Plaza of the Americas in Dallas. Well, he and Murchison were partners in American Liberty Oil, which owned actually owned the Matagorda place, and they were splitting it up. And they flipped a coin for who would own the Matagorda land. And Toddy Lee Wynn won the toss, much to Murchison's regret. Well, Wynn was not just interested in oil and real estate. He was also funding the first attempt at private space travel. He allowed a company called Space Services to use Matagorda as the location to launch the first private rocket in the world. Well, their first attempt ended in a disaster because the rocket blew up on the launch pad. But on September 9th, 1982, they were ready to try again with the rocket called the Conestoga. That rocket had been painted to match Wynn's airplane. A lot of time and effort and money had gone into this, and they were very excited about it. The night before the launch, unfortunately, Mr. Wynn fell ill in his room at the Matagorda house. His pilots immediately got the plane ready to leave, loaded Mr. Wynn on the plane, and as the plane lifted off, and began to ascend over his island, Mr. Wynn passed away quietly. Well, the next morning, one of the Space Services personnel took a felt-tip pen and wrote, Mr. Wynn, God bless you, on the side of the rocket, 
At 1018, they launched it, and it climbed successfully into space. It landed 300 miles downrange into the Gulf of Mexico, just as they had planned, and the first private space flight had been a success from Matagorda Island. Well, today, San Jose Island remains in the Bass family, who, as far as I know, still use it as an island getaway. In the 80s, the Wynn family sold their part of Matagorda Island over 11,000 acres to the Texas Nature Conservancy. That organization later sold it to the U.S. Department of the Interior, and it is part of the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in partnership with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. That area is the, currently the largest wintering ground for the very endangered species of whooping crane. But for a while, those islands, San Jose, Matagorda, and Mustang, were a center of political and economic power in Texas and the United States. Well, this episode of Wise About Texas came about through the suggestion of one of the show's loyal listeners, Mr. Jared Forster from Houston, Texas. He hunts out of the St. Charles Bay Hunting Club, which is located very near to San Jose Island. I've been there with him, and I think we've hunted ducks about where FDR had anchored aboard the USS Potomac. It is a beautiful area of Texas and definitely worth a visit. So now we come to the part of the show called Getting There, where I tell you how to go see some of the things we mentioned in this episode. The USS Potomac is now restored, and it's docked in Oakland, California. They have tours available, and the yacht actually goes on cruises. So you can explore and even sail on the ship that docked at San Jose Island in 1937 and led to some very important and powerful friendships. So check that out. You can uh, They have a website, USSPotomac.com. You can even visit San Jose Island. Now, since it's privately owned, you'll only be able to visit the beach, but there's a regular ferry from Port Aransas that will allow you to enjoy part of this historic island. The town of Port Aransas sits on the location of Robert Mercer's old homestead, and there's plenty to do in Port A, as we call it here in Texas, and it is a great place to spend some time this summer. If you like to fish, it just doesn't get any better than that area. So check out uh, www.portaransas.org and go see a very beautiful part of Texas. The Aransas National Wildlife Refuge is truly one of the jewels of the state. It's accessible by the public, and as I mentioned, it's the wintering ground for the highly endangered whooping crane, which are, I've been down there to see them, and they are truly incredible birds. The website for the refuge is www.fws.gov slash refuge slash Aransas. It's worth a visit. Now, unfortunately, there's no public access to the Matagorda Island part of the refuge, but you need to go down there and see this gorgeous area of Texas. And finally, I want want to let you know that a few years ago, writer Alan Pepper with the Dallas Morning News did a great story on the political goings-on at Matagorda and San Jose Islands, and there are some great photos and videos in connection with this story. It's on the Internet. I'm going to put a link to that story on the website You need to go see some of the pictures of San Jose and Matagorda and Sid Richardson and Clint Murkison and Roosevelt on his fishing trip. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Thanks to everyone who signed up to support the preservation of Texas history. If you'd like to support this show, please visit www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, slash wiseabouttexas. Like and share the show's Facebook page and follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. If you've got some suggestions for Texas history you'd like to learn more about, let me know via Twitter or email me at host at wiseabouttexas.com. I hope everyone continues to have a good summer. And until next time, God bless Texas and we'll see you down the road.